Good afternoon, everybody. I must thank the organizers for getting me this opportunity to speak to all of you here at Suratkal. It's really a good day, bright day, and I'm so happy to be here with all of you. So when I used to be a young boy like you, I used to wonder, what is India? And what is the future of India? I had read history in my school. I knew India is a poor country. I did not have read it. I could see it. India was a poor country. I used to feel very bad. India has been impoverished. Even the Kohinoor has been taken away. There's nothing in India. Should I migrate and make my career elsewhere? I used to wonder. Finally, 40 years later, I found an answer, and the answer is, India is the future of the world. Stay here. <laughs> so is this just patriotic feeling, or does the data say us something? So let me share with you, my young, dear engineers, what The Economist has to tell you about what is India. In 1947, when India became independent, it was in a sad state of affairs. The debate is 80 or 90% of the population is below the poverty line. Literacy rate was around 10%. With that sort of a baggage, you had to be slow in your growth strategies. India was slow and steady, but very strong. No revolution, no upheaval, like an elephant carried everybody along on the growth path. 1991 attained certain level of maturity and certain level of literacy and reduced poverty, ready to gallop, started changing, the reforms were introduced. But in our neighborhood, there was a global factory. Industry was suffering within the country. And now we know our focus is industrialization. That's our immediate objective. Pretty much aware, 70 years of independence, we are still very young. We have a long way to go. That awareness exists with us. But these 70 years have been momentous, and I'll show you how. And from 1991, when we started the reforms in a bigger way, we have been growing very rapidly. We are actually the fastest growing economy after China in the last 20 odd years. But we have not been greedy. We have not manipulated our exchange rates. We have followed a very ethical path. We have built our international reserves and the world respects that India's international reserves are adequate and respectable, and the country is strong. But we are aware, within the country, though we have made progress, there are variations in the per capita income, which is total income of the country divided by population. That variation, we are aware. We are also aware there are large variations in terms of population within the states. There are states which have very high population, there are states which have less population. But as a country, we have grown from 36 crore in 51 to 121 crore in 2011. That's a huge population, huge population. With this huge population, obviously the question is the density of population. Some states have very high density, like you can see in Bihar and West Bengal. Other states have low density, people crowding per square kilometer, but amazing, the country is peaceful and coexisting without any problem. The literacy rates, rapid transformation, 
fourfold increase in 70 years from around 18% to about 73%. Massive growth in literacy. State-wise, there are variations. We have Kerala on one hand, highly literate. We have Bihar on the other, suffering, lagging behind, but not far behind. Other indicator of growth is infant mortality rate. And if you compare it from 81, we have come a long way, one third of it. There are again variations within the states, but in aggregate, massive progress has been made in 70 years. Still another economic indicator, access to safe drinking water. And if you compare again the data for 30 years, 81 to 2011, you can see a substantial growth and rise has taken place here. Poverty, which I mentioned right in the beginning, despite the country growing rapidly in terms of population, averaging nearly 2.4% per year, though in the previous years it's come down, the growth, decadal growth rate and annual growth rate has come down, despite population growing, the level of poverty has been reduced for 55% to just about 30% which in a rapidly moving economy is a very substantial progress. I would like to mention a very important point here. Highly diverse country, very secular in approach, all thoughts, all religions thrive in this continent and thrive progressively. And here is the data from 61 showing that India is a very diverse and tolerant country. If you look at state-wise data, it's very amazing. Different states have different population, but all coexisting, respect for all religions, festivals celebrated so together, cultural events celebrated together, very diverse, but very respectful. The motto being clear, unity in diversity. Different languages, different dressing patterns, different food habits, but one common market across the country. So, what is happening in India? What is this emerging country? Why is there so much of interest in this country? Firstly, a very large market, large population, large middle income group, large payment capacity. High returns on investment, obviously. High growth rate of the economy, 7% on an average for the last decade, which is really, in view of the global crisis, really very substantial. High investment of nearly 30%, which spurs growth, and highly developed financial markets. Two, highly developed stock exchanges, 5,000 listed companies on each one of them. And you know, the very best regulators in the world, RBI and SEBI and RBI, such an effective regulator, while there were global crisis on banking, India was totally insulated. The country is always in election mode, either states or the center. Nothing matters. Political stability, regimes come, regimes go. No problems. But there is one disruptive factor which is very disruptive to growth, very useful and meaningful for growth, but effectively harms the youth population. And that is corruption, harms growth. Something has to be done. How do we know there's corruption? Look at this indicator, amazing indicator. The gross fiscal deficit, global yardstick is 3% of GDP, and up here in our country, we run a deficit of nearly 8 to 10% of GDP, and not for two years, not for two decades, from 1981 onwards. Really, God's own country. Why is the deficit so high? The tax revenue is very low. Worldwide, the tax revenues are about 30 to 36% of GDP, in some cases 40% of GDP in our country, about 18% of GDP. Why is the tax so low? People don't want to pay taxes. As simple as that. Why? Just look at the statistics on the screen. 
It's a mind-boggling statistics. Persons engaged in organized sector, 42 million. Individuals filing return for salary income, 17 million. Informal sector individual enterprises in the country, 56 million. Number of returns filed, 18 million. Companies registered in the country, 1.4 million. Companies filing return, half of it. Companies declaring zero income or losses, one quarter of it. Companies declaring profit of less than one crore, another quarter. 30,000, 35,000 odd countries only tell their profit is more than one crore. This is amazing. That's not just over. Look at this statistics. Individuals filing tax return, 37 million. Individuals saying I'm below the exemption limit, one fourth. Income between 2.5 to 5 lakh, half of them. People above 5 lakh income, 7.6 million in the country, of which salary paying people are 5.6 million. Something is wrong in the country. Obviously, the sledgehammer had to be used and demonetization was undertaken. 86% of the currency was hit. This is not the first time. It happened earlier in 46 and 78, just not those two events. Almost every decade, there have been lots of steps to unearth unaccounted money. No success. Just imagine the country, 86% of the currency hit, no revolution, no upheaval. People are willing to do more and ready for 2,000 rupees to be demonetized. That's the country. Willing, wishing, praying for a corruption-free India. Year later, economy is back on recovery. The beautiful thing is, it has raised awareness. I have been writing repeatedly. You cannot have an island of clean financial system amidst an ocean of corrupt social system. There is a need for an overall eco-cleaning in the system and that has to be done by all of us. The chartered accountants who sign those statements, the auditors, the lawyers, the bankers, religious institutions, cultural centers, you and me too. All of us have a role to play in it. So the fight against corruption continues and goods and services tax, according to me, is a sequence in that. It has an excellent cross-country experience. It is a simple tax to follow, subsumes many, many indirect taxes, including the octroi. It harmonizes tax laws, so one nation, one market, one tax rate, I think it's beautiful. It's economically efficient, distributionally attractive, and easy to administer. It ensures a wider tax base. Most importantly, it will help track unaccounted transactions. That to me is the most important thing. Fine, 70 years of India, last one year of major steps for fighting corruption. What is the future like? Very, very bright. Look at the data. This is not me, the patriotic Indian. This is coming from the IMF, the World Bank. Just imagine the World Bank is saying today's papers, India will grow at 7.5% next year. Indians are saying we will grow to 6.5 from 2017 to 18. The world is telling you have the potential, come on. The future is so bright. How about inflation? Generally around 5%, which is very good. How about the fiscal story? The global yardstick is that deficits should generally be less than 3% of GDP and we are very high but the correction, the direction is so apparent in 2022. How about the liabilities that we have incurred in the past? Even now they are in control and in the future they will obviously continue to be under control. How about the external account? Again, the data from the IMF and the World Bank. The global yardstick is 
2.5 to 3 percent of GDP as a current account deficit is healthy and we are within that range. And please remember, we are not a resource rich country. We are not petroleum rich. We are not Chileans like copper rich. We are working hard. Every penny on our external account is earned through a hard way. The most important thing is the human resources. We will have the largest amount of human resources in a few years from now. Thanks to the fact that we did not follow the one-child policy. What does this really mean? We are the youngest country in the world. In the next few years till 2050, we'll have the largest workforce and the reservoir of people below the age of 15 will be also amongst the largest that we will have in our country. We will be driving everything that the world needs. So, a country which had a golden past, the Indus Valley civilization, the richest on the planet, timeless Vedas, fountain of knowledge, and the richest country of the world in AD zero, accounting for 33% of world GDP. For next 1100 years, we were accounting between 20 and 25%, one single country, accounting for 20 to 25%, one fifth to one fourth of world GDP. Unfortunately, when you are so rich, plunders, plunderers will come and rob you, and that's exactly what happened. In 1947, when the Brits went away, and probably because they found they have already plundered enough, India's contribution to world GDP was around 3%. 33% AD zero, Three percent, 1947. But within 70 years of independence, when we are back to self-governance, there is no international fora which can afford to make a policy decision without India being there. If they have the Silicon Valley, we have Bangalore and Hyderabad, we have Chennai, such rich, demographic dividend that we have is waiting in the wings to flourish. So what are the important factors that make India a desired destination? According to me, if you look at India's history for four, for four to five thousand years, including the Indus Valley civilization, it is strategic thinking and meticulous planning, Chanakya, Sir Chanakya. Open to ideas, trade, Debate and discuss. The ports are open. The sea route is open. The silk route is open. Open to ideas. Respecting others. Building consensus. Being aware of the pizza, but eating a parotta. Always alert and well prepared. Look at the financial sector of India vis-a-vis -vis the financial sector of the rest of the world. And as I just mentioned, respectful to diverse religions, culture, and ideology. You have the leftists and you have the rightists, all existing together in a single country, running governments parallel at the same time. Most importantly, my young friends, the self-confidence that Indians had is unparalleled. I would like to invite you to Google and see the story of capital account convertibility. While the rest of the world was opposing us in the Reserve Bank, saying that capital account convertibility is important, India was the lone country which said, no, until we are ready for it. Today, 20 years later, multilateral, multilateral institutions have agreed Capital account convertibility has to be conditional. That self-confidence in what we do 
and how we do. The second example is derivatives, and you should Google and see how India fought the battle of derivatives. So, very hardworking population, irrespective of the ideologies, thousands of years, regime, urge to surge. That's the most important thing. Now I see green shoots, hailing a bright future. While India is on the expansionary zone, regional cooperation, mutually expansionary markets, look east, look Central Asia, strengthen relations with neighbors. Incidentally, the plunderers are shrinking by every day out of Brexit. I foresee a United States of South Asia, or at the least, a monetary union like Euro with a single currency where India plays a pivotal role. So, I would like to conclude by saying, India, a vibrant and democratic country, is the future of the world. Come join us. Thank you.